Hello and welcome to another hands-on engineering video. In this video, we'll be continuing our crash course on pointers and arrays. In the last video, we covered some basics about pointers, like what they are and how you can create and use them. We also covered how variables look in memory, and how we can sketch out the behavior of a program visually. If you haven't seen that video yet, we recommend that you watch it before watching this one. In this video, you'll learn how to design software that uses arrays and debug common errors with arrays and pointers. We'll be throwing around the terms contiguous memory, primitive types, and array. Contiguous just means sequential, so contiguous memory refers to a block of memory where addresses are one after another. A primitive type is a basic type that's natively supported by the language that we're using. You can think of it like a building block of data. An array is a contiguous block of memory where we're just storing one type of data. This means that arrays are homogeneous. Arrays are always a fixed size. As mentioned, they are also elements of the same kind and are stored one after another in memory. A really important concept that might save you some frustration down the road is that primitive types are default initialized to undefined values. Arrays are a primitive type, so if you don't explicitly set the contents of it somehow, you'll wind up with junk memory. As a note on the first bullet, you might wonder about vectors or dynamic arrays if you've ever used them, since these containers clearly are not fixed in the number of elements that we can hold. The specifics on how this works are beyond the scope of this short lesson, but in the end it boils down to the container allocating a fixed size array, and then making a new and bigger one when it's reached capacity. If you want to learn more, you may be interested in the x280 course. Let's check in really quickly. Try the following problems and we'll be back shortly. These questions are directly explained in the previous slides, so be sure to go back and review them if you got something wrong. Just to reiterate, since it's very important, implicit initialization of an array will result in junk values. To declare an array, you write the type, the variable name, and then in square brackets, the size of the array. If you want to explicitly initialize it, you can use what's called an initializer list. You write the elements that you want to be in the array in curly brackets, like we do in this slide. Say you wanted to have your array filled with a sane value, like an array of all zeros instead of junk values. You can use an empty initializer list to accomplish this. To access an element at index n, write the name of the array, and then in square brackets, put the index of the element that you want to access. Data usually has a value associated with it. For example, the element in the array to the right at index 2 does have a value with it, 2. But what would the value of the entire array be? The answer is that there is none, since that doesn't really make sense. The language does the most reasonable thing it can when you try to get the value for an array. It returns a pointer to the first element. This is called array decay. In the code below, the first C outline reads, print the address of the first element of the array, which is 0x1000. The line below it might be less obvious, but it actually does the same thing and also prints 0x1000. Why? Well, C out requires a value to be passed in, and when we give it an array, it can't resolve a value, so it decays into a pointer. And printing this pointer prints out the value of the pointer, which is the address that it stores. 
The next line uses the fact that array decays into a pointer, and then dereferences it to change the value to negative 1. This effectively updates the first element of the array to negative 1. The final line prints out the value of the first element, which we just changed to be negative 1. Array decay has a lot of consequences that might not be obvious at first. It's important to remember, though, that computers do exactly what you tell them to. The hard part about this is that C and C++ have a lot of subtleties in their syntax. That's all that makes this tricky. The first thing is array assignment. You might expect this code to assign array2 to equal array1, but actually, when you try assigning something, it requires a value, the thing that you want to set it equal to. When you assign an array, the program tries to get the value of the array, which we just demonstrated actually decays the array into a pointer. This causes a compile error. The left side is an array, and you're trying to set it equal to the right side, which has decayed into a pointer. An even less obvious consequence is when you try to pass an array to a function as a parameter. By default, parameters are passed by value, so calling a function with an array as a parameter will cause it to decay into a pointer. In the code below, all of these function definitions are actually equivalent to func4, the last one. No matter what you do, you'll wind up passing in a pointer which stores absolutely no information about the original array's size. If you're ever in a situation where you want to pass a primitive array into a function, you'll need to pass in the size of the array too as a separate parameter. There is actually another way to handle this, using what's called a sentinel value. This is where the last value of your array represents the end of it. And this is how C strings work. They use a null character as a sentinel value. We're not going to go in depth on sentinel values in this video. Let's do another knowledge check and make sure that you can use arrays in your code and understand array decay. Here are the answers. Again, this is content that we've covered in the last few slides, so go back if you need to make sure that you have a solid foundation on this concept. Now we'll cover the basics of pointer arithmetic. We left this concept out of the first video because pointer arithmetic is most useful for dealing with arrays. It's often helpful to have a pointer to elements in an array and move the pointer forwards and backwards through the elements. Pointer arithmetic refers to the fact that you can take a pointer and add and subtract an integer and even add and subtract other pointers. Something to note is that these operations are in terms of number of elements, not bytes. This means that if I have an int pointer and I add 1 to it, it'll move forward in memory the size that one int occupies, not one byte. Let's see a visual example of using pointers to move through arrays. On this slide, we have some code that we've run up to the point where the white arrow is. The image on the right is a memory diagram showing all of the variables, addresses, and values at this point in time. The first line declared an array of size 4. You might notice that in some cases, we can actually omit the size of the array when the initializer list makes it clear to the compiler how big the array is. The second line defines a pointer to an int called ptr1 and assigns it the first element in the array by allowing it to decay. The second line creates another pointer 
called PTR2, and gets the address of the second element in the array. The third and fourth line do the same thing, but using different equivalent syntaxes that make use of pointer arithmetic. When we step forward one line of the program, we increment the pointer by one. This will move it forward one element in memory, causing it to point to the next element in the array. You can see that PTR1's arrow has moved forward when this line is done executing. The final line shows that we can subtract pointers to get the number of elements between them. We can see that in this diagram, this would be 2 minus 1, or 1 element. Let's do a quick checkpoint on pointer arithmetic. Give these problems a try, and we'll show you the answer in a few seconds. The first three questions come directly from the previous slides, so go back and review them if you were confused. The last question is trickier and involves some of the concepts that we covered in the first video. The way this works is that we have a variable, goBlue, that decays into a pointer when we try adding 2 to it. This effectively moves the pointer forward by two elements. Since the goBlue pointer was to the first element and we advanced it forward twice, we now have a pointer to the third element. To actually access the value of this element, we dereference our pointer by prefixing it with the asterisk. In the last video, we covered some pointer mistakes that lead to undefined behavior. These issues come up most frequently when dealing with pointers to elements in arrays. For instance, if you increment your pointer past the end of an array, or decrement it to before the first element of your array, then you have a pointer that points to something that's dangerous to dereference. Having this pointer itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the second that you dereference it, you have undefined behavior. This mistake happens most commonly when you're iterating through an array. The way to ensure that you never step out of bounds is to have a variable denoting the length of the array, or store a sentinel value like C strings do with their null character. A good tool to find these mistakes doesn't really exist for Arduino programs, but for programs that you compile with G++ or GCC, you can and should run your executable through Valgrind. Valgrind is a dynamic analysis tool that helps locate undefined behavior. In the case of reading memory that you shouldn't with pointers, Valgrind will catch this and yell at you with an error like invalid read of size 4 or 8 or whatever the size of what you tried accessing was. It's a very good tool and will save you a lot of time debugging. This final check is really important and shows very common issues you'll face. Give them a try and we'll be back with the answers shortly. The first question is safe behavior. We create a pointer to an integer by advancing a pointer to the first element of GoBlue forward by five times. Now our pointer points to an element just past the end of the array GoBlue. This is actually fine. We are allowed to have a pointer to a place in memory that we don't control. The issue comes when we try to dereference this pointer, which is what we do in problem two. This behavior is unsafe. That's all we have for you today. 
Hopefully, you learned a little bit more about pointers and how they relate to arrays. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and we'll try to get back to you. Be sure to subscribe for more hands-on engineering videos in the future, and we'll see you next time.